Erev Tov Rishon Letzion. Good morning in Skokie. Greetings to friends of Israel around the world. My name's Wayne Firestone, and we're talking fashion today on our webinar. And, you know, after a year or two of sitting around in our sweats and not really thinking too much about the latest styles and fashions, we're actually going to uh, get you out of that closet into a very exciting closet, the archives at Shankar College of Engineering and Design. I know you're thinking archives, they're dusty, they're sort of boring, they have documents and typewritten uh, 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 pages from the past. That's not this archive that you're going to see. But before we uh, take a dive into this particular uh, archive, uh, what's in your closet? Tell me uh, in the chat, for those of you watching, what's the most fashionable suit or shoes or clothing item that you sort of think about, you know, hanging on to? Uh, I know we've had to spend a lot of time throwing out stuff from our closets, uh, but we want to know, you know, when you, when you took a look in there, and you said to yourself, boy, I can't wait for an opportunity to put on that suit, or I can't wait for an opportunity to wear that dress again. So tell us about an article of apparel that you have that is sort of uh, in your own personal archive of, of fashion. And if you remember what year it was from, um, it doesn't have to be the exact year, but part of what we're gonna look at today is fashion throughout the ages in Israel and indeed what stands the test of time. So if you're willing to share, put something into the chat, let us know. We promise we won't ask you to post any pictures or to uh, uh, pose for us today, because indeed we're gonna be looking at fashion from uh, a really expert point of view. We have with us uh, uh, today, Tal Granovsky Amit, who is the uh, director and curator at the Rose Archive. She's literally, as we speak, in Ramat Gan now at the archive. She's going to show us some really cool videos, some pictures. She's going to take us on this virtual tour of, of, of the archive and let us know what it's about. She'll tell you a little bit about her, her background. Uh, she's uh, really Israeli trained, but really operating on a global scale. She previously has served as a... Uh, at, uh, uh, editor in chief at the Design Museum in Cologne. And she is now uh, really like a kid in a candy shop in the fashion world because every day she gets to come in and see some of the most uh, important designs and statements about Israeli fashion and how that has evolved over time. And with us to introduce Shankar College first, for those of you that haven't visited or don't know about its real special legacy in Israel, we have a true friend of Israel, a friend of AIFL, a friend of Shankar, technically the liaison to the friends of Shankar, our dear friend, Linda Krar. She is a professional musician in her background, has an eclectic background that includes a real passion uh, for Israel and Zionism and a passion for her, her family and family roots, which now includes a next generation as a proud Safta. So we're happy, Linda, to have you wearing your many different hats and talking fashion with us today. Tell us a few words of introduction about Shankar College and why it's something that, that you're so passionate about. Wayne, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here today. Uh, this is Castro. I would estimate it uh, maybe 2013, if we're going to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it was raining. Okay, that's it. Uh, so Shankar College of engineering, design, and art is a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, four-year college. It's home to more than 3,000 students, faculty, and academic staff. They are all motivated and dedicated, inspiring, creative. If you come to Israel, we will welcome you there with open arms. We always love hosting people. Shankar was established in 1970. And it today provides academic qualification and R&D for Israeli industry. 
So when you finish your four-year program or your postgraduate program, you are going on to change the landscape of Israel in the areas of engineering, design, and art. And you may be changing the landscape of the world. Uh, the college was named after Aryeh Shankar. He was a pioneer in Israel's text textile industry, also known as the Shmata business, founder and first president of the Industrialist Union in the land of Israel. He did not live to see a school named for him, unfortunately. Uh, I'll just tell you a couple words about um, our leadership. Uh, Shankar is led by Professor Shezaf Rafaeli, the president, he is a researcher and scholar of computer science and human behavior. Gaming is a passion of his, and he has uh, uh, provided gaming in the uh, some sectors such as aviation and banking to help train security. Uh, we have our beloved and dedicated leaders and key members of the Shankar family. Uh, Israel-based international chair is Orit Efrati, and our New York-based friends chair is Susan Pernick. So I'm sending a shout out to them now. And uh, what else can I tell you? I guess I can tell you that uh, in addition to all the, ne the negotiating of collaborations right now with institutions and industry around the world, Shankar is ranked in the top echelon uh, of the top 50 fashion schools in the world. And it's highly popular international hackathon, Shankar Jam Week, takes place this year starting on February 14th. And the topic will be gerontology. So it should be fascinating. And as a new grandparent, I'm particularly interested. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it back to you, Wayne. Thanks. Thanks so much, Linda. And uh, uh, Tal, uh, we already have people commenting on what's in their closet and what's not in their closet, uh, a Hermes scarf. Uh, uh, are we gonna find any scarves in uh, the, the collection that you're gonna show us today? And tell us a little about the archive before we take a look at the video. Sure, there are many scarves, many shoes, many bags, many dresses, many suits, many ensembles. You just have to pick one of the thousands. So everyone will have a, a pick of their own, I'm sure. Great. So go ahead, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your background, how you got into this. I know you are, you are, uh, you, you just light up every time uh, uh, we, we, we mention the, the archive itself. And I know uh, it's a personal pro point of pride for you that, that you'll be sharing with us in a moment. But, you know, give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself and how you got into this. So yeah, I can definitely uh, say about myself that I love my job. It's not uh, as, you know, it's from the bottom of my heart. I just love what I'm doing and I think it shows basically. So um, my, name, my name is Tal Granovsky Amit. I'm the director of the Rose Archive and Textile. Um, I, I have a, a Shankar BA graduate. I am a Shankar BA graduate from the worldly acclaimed fashion design department, as uh, Linda uh, uh, said. Um, I also have an MA from Tel Aviv University where I researched fashion and later actually graduated with honors. So in 2016, I joined the archive. And since then I'm doing my best to promote this amazing place. And in this talk, I will present to you uh, Israeli fashion through the archives collection. And I'll show you uh, the importance of it in the academia. But first, I would like to thank you all for joining us. And I would like to thank Wayne, Naomi, Cassia, uh, Giovanni, and all the AIFL team for your willingness to show Shankar during these uh, challenging times. So uh, a minute before we start, I would like to um, put on the video. So you have, you'll have a bit of a sense of what it is we're doing here in the archive and how we look at clothing, not just as um, something as fashionable or unfashionable, but what we actually can see through them. Super. ארכיון האופנה והטקסיל של שנקר הוא האוסף היחיד בארץ של אופנה שלא בידיים פרטיות. הוא מכיל בתוכו בערך 7,000 אובייקטים של טקסטיל, אופנה ואביזרים ששמורים בתנאים מאוד קפדניים. 
כדי לשמר את האוצרות כאן לדורות הבאים במשך כמה שיותר זמן, כמעט אף אחד לא רשאי להיכנס לתוך חלל האחסון. לכן החלטנו לתת לכם הצצה מיוחדת בלעדית לתוך אוצרות מהאוסף. במחקר אופנה אנחנו לא מסתכלים רק על הפן האסתטי של הבגד, אנחנו מנסים לחפש איך כל מיני רעיונות חברתיים, תרבותיים, כלכליים, מגולמים בתוך אובייקט. אופנת שנות ה-20 היא דוגמה נהדרת לזה. את השמלה הזו, לדוגמה, קיבלנו מאספן אמריקאי. זו שמלה משנות ה-20, בעצם בת כמעט 100 שנים. זה אומר שהיא עברה לא מעט גלגולים עד שהיא הגיעה אלינו. עבודת השימור והרסטורציה שנעשתה עליה הייתה אחת היפות והמעניינות שנעשו כאן בארכיון. פייטים שהתרופפו קיבלו חיזוק, חרוזים שנפלו נתפרו מחדש. אפשר לראות כאן אלמנטים של אומנות התקופה, כשכל השמלה בעצם תפורה ומאותרת בקווים גיאומטריים, ובצד יש לנו את הקשת המפורסמת של אומנות הארט דקו. מה שעוד אפשר לשים לב זה בעצם את מלאכת הבילוש שאנחנו עושות כשאנחנו מסתכלות על שמלה. הפרחים שנמצאים בצד נראים לנו טיפה זרים. גם החרוזים שתפורים בחלק התחתון הם שונים מהחרוזים הבהירים בחלק העליון. הדבר הזה גורם לנו לתהות האם מדובר בעצם בעיצוב מקורי או משהו שהתווסף עם השנים. באותה תקופה נחקק בארצות הברית חוק היובש שאסר על מכירה וייצור של משקאות אלכוהוליים. הדבר הזה גרם לפריחה של מסבעות מחתרתיות שבהם פרח ריקוד הצ'ארסטון. ריקוד סופר תזזיתי ואנרגטי עם המון המון תנועה בתוכו. השמלה הזאת היא דוגמה מעולה כיצד בגד יכול לתמוך בתנועה ואפילו להעצים אותה. היא עשויה מבד משי דקיק דקיק, שבקצוות של המכפלות רקומים המון המון חרוזים שמשמשים כמו משקולות ובתנועה הכי הכי מינימלית של הגוף. אפשר לראות עד כמה הבגד זז בגלל המשקולות האלה. וגם הפרח. עשוי מחתיכות דקיקות של משי שאמורות גם הן לזוז יחד עם התנועה של הגוף. וגם כשהתנועה נפסקת, אז הבגד ממשיך לזוז. במהלך מלחמת העולם הראשונה נולדה לנו האישה המודרנית. נשים שהיו צריכות לצאת לעבוד בעצם זכו באיזושהי עצמאות שלא הייתה להן לפני כן. בעקבות זה גם המלתחה השתנתה, המכפלות התקצרו, המכוכים התרופפו, המותן התאשתשה, וגם השיער שבמשך שנים נחשב לכוח הנשי המסורתי, התקצר והפך להיות קרה בקווים גיאומטריים ויחסית חדים לאופנה של לפני התקופה. אופנת שנות ה-20 שימשה מקור השראה להמון מעצבים ומעצבות גם מאוחר יותר. אולי הדוגמה הכי מובהקת היא מיוצ'ה פראדה, שמעצבת בסגנון של האישה המשוחררת של שנות ה-20 גם קולקציות סופר עכשוויות וסופר מעודכנות. עד כדי כך שבהפקת הגרסה המחודשת של גצבי הגדול ב-2013, מעצבת התלבושות השאילה 40 תלבושות מהארכיונים של פראדה שישמשו בסצנת המסיבה. התלבושות האלה לא עברו שום שינוי היסטורי. על תקופה דרך בגדים, זה משהו שתמיד כל כך מרגש אותי. היכולת לתת לנו איזשהם רמזים לאישה, מי היא הייתה, מה היא חשבה, איך היא התלבשה, מה ציפו ממנה, ואיך היא מורדת במוסכמות האלה דרך בד, חוט, מחט ותפר. Well, Tal, um, you said that you enjoy learning history through garments. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've learned. And I, I know you have uh, uh, lots of slides to show us from uh, the, the, the archive, but um, it's a really interesting perspective that, um, that, that, that you're bringing in before we you know, delve into the specifics of the archive. Um, I wonder if you can share a little bit about your 
um, your, your view as a historian, as a researcher coming at this particular uh, topic? Sure. sure, so first of all, um, my specialty is Israeli uh, design and Israeli history. Um, since I'm from Israel, born here and raised here. So naturally, I wonder and I look and I try to figure out what is Israeli design? Is there Israeli fashion? It's an ongoing question that I'm not sure I can even start to have a, a, an objective answer to. Um, but I came to this field uh, from actually from researching uh, clothing during uh, the Nazi occupation and the way that French women uh, dressed uh, as a kind of a way to um, to object the Germans in uh, Paris. So it it first I started um, my interest actually started from the war and how times of um, uh, how hard times uh, changed the way we see fashion. And here in Israel, living through so many wars, uh, it's just uh, fitting because everything, every time we see a little bit of change, but if we can see the big change of World War II, here every war starts to uh, matter less and less on the way we dress. So this uh, also, uh, it's a very uh, interesting topic for me personally, uh, living through the, those times. Um, and once I, I understood there is actually a field of fashion research and it's not just design fashion, it's also think fashion and research fashion and uh, look at fashion as a, a field or as a profession that doesn't have to do only with our appearance, but also what we communicate. It was a really great uh, revolution and um, uh, for me, uh, revelation, not revolution, sorry. Uh, so once I, uh, I figured that out, I was on my path to, uh, <laughs> to the archive and beyond. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a great intro. And, uh, you know, we're getting some great comments from our, our listeners uh, just acknowledging um, that there is a sort of freedom in the Israeli fashion uh, as someone coming from outside of Israel and seeing how Israelis dress, that, that there is a variety. And, and that variety also uh, uh, gives a sense of sometimes informality, but sometimes a great deal of intentionality of, uh, of, of difference and diversity. And, and, and I think that's one of the beautiful things that, that many of us coming to Israel for the first time sort of witnessed and, and enjoy coming back to see. Uh, so, um, Tal, why don't you uh, go ahead and, and take us on a, a, a bit of a, of, of a virtual tour so we can uh, share more of the visual images. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, so um, we just witnessed the, the archive through the video, but what is actually is the archive? So the Rose Fashion and Textile Archive is quite a unique place in Israel because it holds uh, Israel's only fashion and textile collection. While the Israel Museum and others, they have textile garments in their collection, but they are for most parts uh, ethnic garments that have to do with the Jewish diaspora people. As opposed to their collection, the archive focuses more on collecting fashion and textile as a cultural phenomena. And we actually take pride in collecting both international and local creation. So what started this amazing collection was actually a large donation of garments from FIT in New York. It was gifted to Shinkar in 1986. And this donation was sent here rather than anywhere else in the world, uh, thanks to the deep connections Shinkar has with the American Jewish community. Uh, these connections between the American community and the college were based from uh, early years on the Jewish textile trade and were developed and broadened to include arts, uh, design and engineering through the years. So 
by the time we are now, uh, the archive grew bit by bit, and it consists today of about 8,000 garment garments, um, well, pieces of garments, uh, textile, and accessories. So due to its uniqueness, the new and modern archive storage space uh, you've just seen in the video, uh, donated by Rappaport family, uh, it, stand, it's, it stands in all museal preservation criteria, such as climate control and humidity control. And this resulting in the archive actually taking an active part in exhibitions at museums and galleries all over Israel. Uh, you can see here a couple of garments from the collection exhibited in the uh, 1965 Today exhibition at the Israel Museum. So the collection has a wide variety of garments with international importance, from this Donald Brooks feathers dress that the Metz Costume Institute also has. This dress was even featured in a Diana Vreeland inspired bazaar spread starring Sarah Jessica Parker. We'll mention her again. Uh, very soon, uh, and onto a dinner dress that once belonged to, Jesse, to Jackie Kennedy. You can see here that the sketch of the dress is currently in the Victorian Albert collection in London. Uh, in 1963, Jackie Kennedy wore this dress designed by Oleg Cassini to a state dinner in Canada with President Kennedy, and we're all very excited that it's here in our, uh, in our archive. So all of these are uh, set aside iconic Israeli design pieces, like the mesquite desert coat. The mesquite desert coat that was even um, worn by Audrey Hepburn uh, is an, a great example of Israeli design. Uh, mesquite was founded by Ruth Dayan, the ex-wife of Moshe Dayan. Uh, it was a fashion house that expressed her social justice ideals by employing their artisanal traditions of Jewish immigrants and Arabs. Uh, Mesquite had stores all over Israel and sold jewelry, houseware, and textiles, as well as uh, modish clothing. Her success overseas was great, and you could find pieces by Mesquite at Neiman Marcus and Saks Fifth Avenue. There were even international collaborations with Givenchy, Yves Saint Laurent, and Christian Dior. Mesquite incorporated what Israel stands for, this mix of traditions and societies, and it all came together through aesthetics. In 2014, Sharon Tal, a fashion designer and Shankar alumni, uh, who had previously worked for Alexander McQueen, revived Mesquite with uh, Mrs. Dayan's encouragement. Like in past days, Mesquite is now getting international recognition. Not only is the fashion house opening its first pop-up store abroad in New York, but it was actually published just this week that Carrie Bradshaw is wearing a Mesquite dress on screen at the opening episode of the new Sex and the City reboot. When looking uh, at her designs for Mesquite, it's easy to see that Sharon stayed loyal to the historic motifs of the brand recreating and translating the iconic uh, garment uh, to modern style. So when delving into the design details of Mesquite's collection through the years, you can see a great connection to the land of Israel. The desert coat we have just seen is a great example, taking inspiration from Bedouin women, wrapping themselves in wool covers at the cold desert night, as the cold desert night falls. Designer Fini Leitersdorf created a Western fashion garment that is based on local medial, Middle, East, Middle Eastern materials, traditions, and uh, pattern. Though Israel is often portraying itself as Western, we are Middle Eastern after all. Not only that, but Israel is the holy land, the biblical land, the land that sparked the imagination of many through the ages. And the relationship to the land of Israel is both uh, the physical and the spiritual senses. They, it, they were both influenced by late 19th century European concepts of the Orient, uh, Orient's exoticness and charming primitivism. Since not many actually traveled here, painters, poets, and others usually imagined us looking a certain way, preferably exotic, preferably with a camel or a vase by our side. 
So the local style was starting to evolve based on that image of the biblical land and the matching look. You can see here a set of photos created in 1920 during the pre-state uh, Jewish community called the Yishuv. This couple demonstrates the difference between the regular Western fashion portrait they took for themselves and the one meant to be sent to family and friends abroad, recreating the Western imagination of the biblical style into real life through matters of clothing and accessories, hence the vase. So the recreation of the modern biblical Jew image generated an Israeli unique fashion trend that was based on Yemenite handicrafts. These crafts include mainly jewelry and embroidery and were embedded in Western fashion garments. They showcased a way to communicate the Israeli melting pot uh, while also starting to form a local style. In the 1950s, the Witzo and Mesquite Handicrafts organizations served as the main agents for advancing images of Israel's rapidly developing visual culture. In 1937, the woman in, oh, they have cats and dogs raining on us. Um, I hope you can hear well. Okay. So in 1937, the Women International Zionist Organization, known as WITSO, uh, has inherited an, an organization dedicated to Yemenite embroidery called Shani. From then on, they began marketing Shani's products as WITSOs. They did so while preserving original motifs but also including radical Israeli additions like color, size, and shape. They offered the new Israeli train for mainstream society and were received with open arms by local women. You can see here both Shoshana Damari, one of Israel's top singers, late top singers, and Leah Rabin, wife of former prime minister Yitzhak Rabin, wearing garments adorned with Yemenite embroidery. You can also see here a close-up detail of the embroidery itself from a blouse we have in our collection. So although the new local design aesthetics was catching on, the Western fashion ideals were very present when representing Israel to the world. Then, representative women were dressed in the latest Paris fashion trends. Known for designing and dressing many of the first ladies, Lola Bell is considered to be Israel's first couturier. The issue of the right, the right dress for the right occasion was not a simple one for the young and inexperienced state of Israel that identified with the principles of the workers' movement. And Lola managed to transform the issue of the official wear into one that was pleasant. Her great achievement was dressing the women um, in outfits that actually made them look rep representative without feeling as if they were dressed up for a masquerade ball. One of the most known stories about the importance of her work for the, straight, for the state can also indicate her close ties with Israel's leaders. In an interview uh, from the 60s, she talks about her trip to Paris in 1950. Then she said, you needed an official permit to leave the country and she just had to go see the Valentino's new collection. So she formally submitted a request that was questioned. So she went straight to Ben Gurion to arrange her permission immediately. Thanks to her friendship with Paula, his wife, the permit was given and the fashionable future of Israel was restored. So in recent years, the discourse of um, representing the state has taken a bit of a spin and nowadays consists not only of politicians, but also performance artists, beauty queens, and more. In that context, the way we are portrayed in popular culture started to matter, resulting in costumes made by top fashion designers throughout the years. In 1973, Israel started participating in the Eurovision singing contest, and there was no turning back. The way the singers dressed became instant fashion trends 
and the designers became stars, incorporating uh, to the outfits layers of cultural meaning. A couple of these costumes are in our collection, giving us the opportunity to examine them up close. In 1991, fashion designer Yaron Minkowski created a set of costumes for con contestants duo Moshe and Ornadets. They performed the song Kan Noladeti, translating to Here I Was Born. The song deals with the singers and by extension, the global Jewish community, establishing their home here in Israel after 2000 years of wandering. The outfits designed for performing this song were made from Bukharic bed covers he found in the Jaffa flea market. Uh, these bed covers were then sewn to create two piece Eats Mist West ensembles, representing once again, the multicultural society of the Israeli people, where Jewish people from all over the world with different backgrounds and textile traditions finally have a land they can call home. In that connection, although not in our collection, it is worth mentioning uh, outfits designed by Doreen Frankfurt made in 1983, especially for the Eurovision contest that was taking place that year in Munich. Israel sent the singer Ofra Chaza and her choir to sing on German land, a song called Chai, Alive. For that occasion, Doreen designed for them bright yellow outfits, symbolizing the Jewish yellow badge of Nazi occupied Europe and giving it new essence. In collecting pieces for the archive, we look not only at vintage or historical garments, but also try to vision the future and add to our collection contemporary designer pieces, pieces that we feel bring a unique local voice. In that sense, Anat Mishulam and Dochen, operating under the brand name Hollyland Civilians, were a natural choice. After graduating from Shankar, the pair worked abroad for international brands for a few years, experiencing and learning the industry. During this time, they came to realize that in order for them to do something meaningful, they had to return to their, home, to their homeland, Israel. Rather than looking outside for global inspiration, they established their fashion brand using their own identity, roots, and cultural materials. This plain looking t-shirt is one of the contemporary garments that tell a story of the Jewish tradition we have in the archive. It's called the grief t-shirt. It has a small diagonal tear in the fabric, stitched back together by visible stitches. For non-Jews cost customers, this tear would probably be seen as an aesthetic uh, designer decision. But to us, the Jews, this tear has a deeper and greater meaning. It stands for one of the Jewish grief rituals, the Kriya. On the most basic level, the tearing is an expression of pain and sorrow over the passing. Torah laws mandate such, an, such expressions as part of the mourning process. This tear has uh, actually dual symbolism. We are recognizing the loss that our hearts are torn, but ultimately the body is only a garment that the soul wears. And death is when we strip off one's uniform and take on another. The garment may be torn, but the essence of the person within it still is still intact. Another great example of a garment that has socio-cultural layers is this man's shirt by designer Eliran Ardassi. The shirt is covered in the printed image of the Jerusalem stone a type of limestone that must cover all buildings in Jerusalem, hence its name. But it's not just Jerusalem that caught our heart on this garment, but the biographical layer of Eliran that adds even more. You can find pieces of his life embedded in this shirt. He is a gay man who grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home in Jerusalem and now lives a secular life in Tel Aviv. This duality is represented here. It's a man's button-up shirt, the sort, the, the sort uh, that would be probably worn to Shabbat services. 
but made longer in the pattern of a tunic, which blurs the line between men and women's garment. Looking closer at the shirt, you can see another interesting element. It's made from two different types of fabric attached together. One is wool and the other is linen, which make it seems, uh, seem at first glance like it's chatnez, the word for mixed textile clothing that is forbidden by Jewish law. But on closer look, the garment is not quite chatnez, uh, as the term speaks to both being spun or woven together. And since, and since this shirt is pieced together in a way that is almost like an applique, it's technically, technically not chatnez. This actually represents a great aspect in Eliran's work. He uses the Jewish religion from a respectable place, but also from a modern place that comes to show that everything is possible and we can bridge uh, anything. So it doesn't have to be just one way over the other. But it's not just, uh, and it's not only grief and religion here in the archive. After all, many designers wish to be part of the international fashion world. In that sense, one of the top designers of Israel's fashion history is Tamara Yuval Jones. Her resume is so extensive, it could easily fill a three-part miniseries on Netflix. But if I need to point out some of the, of the things she have achieved, it would be that she worked for top fashion houses in Israel during the 60s and 70s. She designed for major theaters. She was Roberto Cavalli's right hand and head designer in Italy. She was a fashion consultant for the Guatemala's government and established her brand uh, and boutiques both in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. She exhibited in galleries and museums, and she was even the head of fashion design departments, both at Shinkar and Bezalel Academy of the Arts. There, she mentored most of Israel's fashion designers uh, through the years. So by now, you've probably figured out that we adore her. Um, but unlike Mesquit and Vizzo and the other designers I've represented so far, Tamar was living the Western dream. She took inspirations from 19th century Europe, inserting elements of Victorian fashion to the garments she designed from lace colors to sleeve patterns and so much more. She had her fashion rooted in the aesthetics of a time and place that she wasn't a part of. And the thing is, it actually worked. It was the eighties and globalization was the most exciting thing. The world was, the world was in our hands. We could see every TV station. We could hear music from the other side of the world. The World Wide Web was starting to get popular here in Israel. And we just wanted to be and look like the rest of the world. And she got it. She made the most wonderful dresses using the best products and workers. She found amazing women who embroidered her dreams and made pattern that made the Israeli fashionista feel as if she's on the cover of Vogue. She dressed the cultural elite of the country. Well, women wanted to wed in her dresses, although she never made bridal wear. She connected Israel to the fashionable world when showcasing a dress like this uh, to the fashion design students is like showing them an actual treasure. On so many levels, this dress is pure gold for us and them. The way she takes the past as inspiration, translating it to modern taste, and the way she doesn't compromise on the quality of the fabric, sewing, and embroidery. All of these uh, elements come into a realization in this dress and make it wonderful piece. And not only that, fortunately for us, we also managed to find an original fashion editorial spread depicting this dress in her original context, showing the students the way it was dressed and styled on the time it was constructed. Tamara and her way of thinking and designing actually carved the way for many Israeli designers uh, that have great success overseas, addressing celebs uh, with dreamy creation. Shachar Avnet is one of those talented designers. Graduated from Shinkar, her rise was meteoric. In only five years, she established herself as one of the most prominent young designers in Israel. Her vibrant colors, 
amazing freestyle embroidery, asymmetric mesh dresses soon became a signature look of hers. Her break was not only local, but also global, as she dressed Beyonce not once, but four times for her videos and concerts. These days, a unique corner of her work is exhibited in the escapist exhibition, The Ball, in Design Museum Cholon, curated by Yara Keidar, who is also a star graduate of the fashion department. There, using her dresses, they recreated the famous painting of Empress Eugenie, no less. In the last couple of years, since digitizing the archive, it has become a larger part of the students' academic studies. The archive gives the students a rare opportunity to look and feel history inside and out. During those visits, we show them that fashion isn't just an aesthetic phenomenon, but an all social cultural one. Through it, they can understand better the time it was constructed from politics to economic tradition, technological advances, and so much more. One of the unique studios the archive is doing in collaboration with the fashion design department is called Old and Fashion. Throughout the course, each student has to choose an item from the archive that inspires them and make a new contemporary fashionable look based on it. I chose to show you two projects that exhibit the wonderful work the students are doing. Kobe Golan is the son of a textile merchant that lived through the golden age of Israeli fashion during the 70s. From an early age, he knew he wanted to be a fashion designer and did anything in his power to achieve his goal. Needless to say, he succeeded. In his olden fashion course, he chose the Israeli famous Kineret blouse by Mesquite and turned her iconic colors and floating seams into a modern look desired by many. The local ethnic aesthetics he refined during this course became his signature style. And the next time you're in Israel, I very much recommend visiting his store. Nitzan Levy's project was based on a Roji Ben Yosef crochet top. She designed her look based on the translation of the past garment, based on her biography. So, her family emigrated to Israel from Iraq, where family jewels were an important part of, is, of the women's lives. In her project, she turned the crochet top to a gold chain one, keeping the jewels a contemporary uh, a component, but turning the gender roles. You can see how she even designed a headpiece that is solely a woman's garment uh, in the Arab world to protest the way men in Iraqi culture were perceived as better than women. So the past six years have taught me uh, that fashion research is growing as an academic field worldwide. And I see it as my goal to make Shinkar and the archive the Israeli hub for leading this way to fashion researchers. In our everyday work, we preserve and restore not only the garments themselves, the pattern, the textile, and the threads, but also the stories and memories they hold. Through them, we are learning and teaching history using fashion and aesthetics as our tools. Due to historical reasons, we are missing so many of these Jewish stories, and we would love to hear some of yours. So next time you're in Israel, please feel free to reach out. We would love to invite you to our humble fashion and textile kingdom. Thank you very much for listening and um, connecting. And uh, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Tal, oh, thank you so much for that very, very rich uh, overview of uh, fashion it, as told through the archives. You really gave us some incredible insights in terms of your work and your expertise. And I mean, I love just seeing the roller skates in, in uh, the, the image of uh, the motor, what people wear when they're on a motorcycle and just sort of thinking about uh, images uh, that are, are, are uniquely is, Israeli in, 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 or, or are, are, are become Israeli uh, in a way, because of uh, the, the 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 culture, how it adopts and adapts that, um, I'm 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 curious about your mandate um, beyond the uh, researching 
and uh, telling this story. How much of the archive is devoted to uh, preservation work? How much is devoted to restoration work? Uh, we saw some incredible examples there of a hundred year old dress. Um, um, I imagine that, that that requires a great deal of expertise uh, to, to maintain something like that. Yes, so we have, uh, we actually have a, a, a woman named Chiked here and she is the archive uh, uh, preserv preservator, Pres preservative, I think. I just we'll lost the word. We'll, right. So um, we do mending and we do preservations and we do conservatory. Conservatory, yeah. Is, uh, thank you, thank you, Ella. <laughs> Elisa. Um, so we do have here a, a conservator in house, and she does um, mending or um, conservation or preservation or recreation, depending on the garment itself. Um, it's a thing that is actually uh, every garment that comes into the archive uh, has to go through an assessment. And in that assessment, we decide uh, if we should um, mend it or fix it, or if we, uh, we keep it as is, or what part of it we should mend, uh, trying to keep not only the appearance of the, um, the garment itself intact, but also the story it holds and the garment's biography. Because we have, for example, an army uh, coat uh, that was used by someone in IDF's early years in 1953, uh, that his daughters took through the 70s and um, knitted uh, its, uh, its hemlines and, um, uh, and uh, and zipper uh, and crocheted some part of it uh, because it was very fashionable to wear uh, army, uh, mater army materials and army coats during this time after the Six Days War in Israel. And uh, if we wanted to showcase only the, the uniform, the uniform coat, the IDF coat, then we would probably take it off uh, in order to get the coat to his original uh, shape. But part of its biography, the uh, object's biography, was that it was transformed later on as a fashion garment. And we don't want to miss that. So in that case, we didn't touch it. But on other cases, we do uh, sometimes uh, recreate the original shape. It really depends on the garment itself and the story behind it and many other uh, perspectives we, we take uh, into account. Well, one of the um, uh, comments we got from one of our, our, our viewers today is someone who bought a mesquite wedding dress in 1974 in Jaffa. And so um, this idea that um, uh, there is this legacy that, that is now available and, uh, to people around the world, uh, both who come and visit in Israel, but also uh, who are seeing Israeli brands in New York, uh, in Paris, in other fashion uh, capitals. Can you, Tal, speak a little bit to that? How um, is, is Israeli fashion, uh, as you showed pictures of uh, Israeli designers for Beyonce's uh, costumes and dresses, how, how did that breakthrough occur that, that is, Israeli fashion is sort of seen as an international um, uh, uh, prize of honor in a sense. Sure, so I think that um, Israel's ha Israel had a golden age uh, of the Israeli fashion during the 60s and 70s, after the Six Days War and into the 70s uh, where exotic fashion was uh, the thing and we, and we mixed the East meets West. So it was a very, very um, a good time for Israeli fashion. Um, and nowadays, uh, it's very different climate because of social media. So first of all, uh, because uh, Israel and the Jewish world is very pro-wedding, and the wedding is a very, very um, central uh, event in the lives of Jewish people and Israeli people, then we have 
uh, amazing bridal wear designers. And these bridal wear designers that bring a bit of traditional uh, bridal wear uh, embedded with the Israeli chutzpah and the uh, way that we think um, of a more casual looks uh, when, we, when we want to dress and we don't want to wear and don't want to feel like in a masquerade ball in our wedding. Um, so there's a, a specific style of bridal wear that actually uh, really um, have uh, success all over the world. And I think that the Israeli designers that, um, that had became known in the bridal wear uh, industry started to carve the way to the more contemporary uh, designers showing today uh, to the international um, uh, public, to the international uh, people like Shacharovnet, uh, like Alon Livne, like Mesquite, and so much more. So um, I think that this is probably the, the way we care uh, of comfort and still we care to look somewhat decent, especially when we're going abroad. Uh, you made a reference earlier uh, to incorporating um, some valuable ancient garments into uh, designs. And one of our, our viewers is asking if you could share some examples of, of that. Yes, so there is, uh, I think the main example, the, the, the one that is always, um, it's like the, <laughs> um, the most, uh, uh, I think important piece of a uh, garment in that sense is a, a dress uh, worn by Ofra Chaza, um, uh, designed by Gotex. Uh, actually, Yaron Minkowski designed it for Gotex. Uh, that is called uh, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, uh, Jerusalem of Gold. And it's a white kaftan or uh, abaya, a very um, large uh, Middle Eastern pattern. Uh, that has on the front of it, uh, on the uh, front piece covering the heart, uh, stones like the Choshen stones of the uh, Kohanim, the, um, uh, the of the of the Torah. So in that way, they uh, embed uh, motifs from ancient or um, uh, religious motifs into uh, modern fashion. That's a great example and a great image for anyone that's seen that uh, particular dress. And I really appreciate the story you shared about uh, Ofra Chaza's uh, costume from the Eurovision. Yeah. I had not heard that story before. And it, it's another example of uh, the, the, the multiple creative artists that uh, Israel brings to any kind of production. And, and I'm I'm wondering, I'm so glad you shared all those names of the different designers as well, um, because uh, we have not maybe celebrated these uh, individuals in the way that, that they need to be uh, lifted up. Um, the people that work on costumes, the people who work on uh, other elements of these uh, you know, very proud moments in uh, Israel's history. And so um, very grateful for that. By the way, we, we have um, uh, the, the, the woman who, who mentioned the wedding dress, um, uh, 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 Wendy, I believe it was, uh, lives in Israel and has shared that, that she is open to donating this to the archive, um, which I know is one of the goals uh, that, that you all set out. Um, uh, uh, Tal, uh, can you talk about that process of... Uh, of how donations uh, uh, to the archive work and what the best way is. We have several people who have asked how to contact you uh, uh, afterwards. Um, uh, so what's the best way uh, for them to, to follow up? Sure. So we're very, very responsive on all ma social media and digital um, aspects. Uh, I would lay, I can write and you can uh, send my email to um, uh, anyone that is interested. Um, we actually get donations from all over the world. Uh, for the first part, people usually send us photos so we can see uh, if 
it's something that uh, uh, we already have or we're interested or where it stands in our um, in the overview of the archive. Once we decide to, um, uh, to accept the donation, then uh, we get the donation here to Ramat Gan and start the assessment uh, process. So we, you can contact us or by email or by Instagram. We actually have an, a, a wonderful website uh, that you can visit. Although in Hebrew, it goes really well uh, through Google Translate. Um, minus the word uh, for beige. So the word beige in Israel in Hebrew is also beige, but Google translates, I uh, think it's Baz. So he translates it to Falcon. So Falcon is actually beige. <laughs> um, so it works really great on uh, Google Translate and you can see uh, the, the very big part of the collection. We have almost 3000 um, garments available on our website. And through it, we, there is a link to our Instagram page, our Facebook, our email, our um, uh, phone number, uh, our address. So you're pretty much welcomed here. And uh, we also uh, have um, uh, visitors, students coming to uh, see the garments, to ask for specific garments, uh, researchers, private people sometimes do hear um, lectures and uh, comes in here lectures we we're uh, giving here in the archive so uh, we try to be as open as we can because we feel that it's not fair that we'll keep all the treasures to ourselves when we can share it with uh, the world tall when i uh try to explain or translate uh israel to people not through google um but uh uh in in a more poetic way um, it's about trend setting and not necessarily trend following. And um, I'm curious, what, uh, it, it was so interesting to see those designs you shared at the end, which were more androgynous or gender bending in a sense. Um, what are the trends you're seeing now in the, the contemporary scene that you think 50 years from now you know, we'll look back in the archive of, of Shankar and, 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 and see from, from this particular period. So I think it's, an, uh, it's a global uh, notion that designers start to um, uh, design from the place they are born, from their roots. We were in the globalization and the whole uh, world trends so much, so many years. Uh, and people are starting to search for their uniqueness in, in a way, because I think that, um, well, my generation and the younger generations, we were basically born into the globalization era. Uh, we felt like we can be whenever, wherever, like there is no actual um, borders. The internet, the web, the flights became cheaper. We could be, you know, the borderlines are just a thing you cross, but they don't really matter. And I think that um, the recent years uh, started, the borders started to matter, not in a political way, but more in a um, self uh, search way. Like what uh, makes me unique uh, compared to someone from the States or from France or England. Uh, what makes me uh, the way I am, the way I'm thinking, and I should dress in a different way because I am from different sets of um, cultural uh, thinking. So it's very interesting to see if the regional costumes uh, or regional fashion will be once again thing that we can uh, identify people through their clothing rather than uh, through their uh, accent. Yeah, and it, it's also interesting just that that uh, even though many cultural reference points like the Eurovision contest are so meaningful to Israelis and, and Europeans, for many years it, and, and arguably even today, it's still not a reference point in America 
Yet Netef comes along and uh, suddenly music and uh, design and costume and identity as you um, uh, refer to uh, for this generation um, are, are sort of combining and again, putting uh, thrusting Israel to the very forefront of trend setting, of creating uh, new cultural artifacts that the whole world is invited, not just to, um, uh, is invited to to enjoy and to um, uh, to uh, participate in, and that's really one. I, I think uh, uh, it, to the extent East meets West had its uh, golden age, you know, we're now in this age where where that can be shared, as you said, because of social media, because of other, uh, even with Zoom. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, Zoom. I don't. I haven't followed whether there are Zoom fashion shows now that have been successful or not, but certainly we see more opportunity to showcase uh, Israel's uh, fashion industry. So uh, I regret we're, we're, we're at the end of our hour. Tal, you've been so gracious with us and uh, uh, bringing us really the richness of, of, of this topic. We sort of recognized that we couldn't do it all in one hour and hope to uh, return to the issue of fashion and actually have a companion episode uh, that, that's planned for our webinar series later in December, on December 22nd, with one of uh, your colleagues, uh, Karen ben Chaim, who will be looking at the issue of, of stitching a national identity uh, and really looking at this from a national perspective, uh, uh, really as a nice companion to this series. Those of you that enjoyed Israeli fashion uh, uh, today, we hope you'll, you'll come back and join us for that. But this coming week, if you've been with us, even if whether this is your first time with us, or you've been with us on, on prior episodes, you have your opportunity to see the best of. We are closing out December with a telethon uh, 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 bonanza for uh, everyone that's gonna start this Sunday. Uh, and, and on Sunday, December 12th, it'll be a two hour special from 12 to two. Normally we're just a one hour webinar, but we're gonna try to squeeze in as much as we can with some of the, the uh, surprise entertainers and uh, uh, participants from our various panels, from science to music, to dance, to culture, to fashion. Please join in with myself and Naomi Reinhardt. We'll be co-hosting this best of series. It'll take place this Sunday in a two hour special from 12 to two. And we have so much content. We're taking it into next Wednesdays. Uh, December 15 episode as well. Should be a lot of fun. This Sunday, Sababa Sunday. If you don't know what that is, you will at the end of our episode. If you do know that what that is, then you absolutely want to be with us uh, to experience this, this, this great opportunity for interaction and going behind the scenes with some of your favorite participants from the whole year. So thanks everyone for being with us. Have a uh, safe week and uh, find something in the closet, you know, that that's a little more fashionable this week and maybe even something uh, that inspired you uh, from a prior trip to Israel or maybe a future one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, the whole team. <laughs>